I'm Russ Brealt with the Shroud of True and Education Project, and welcome to the Shroud Report. My guest today is Dr. John Jackson. Now, John, you are a physicist, and you've been you're a pioneer when it comes to to shroud research. Um, you're uh, one of the organizers of the 1978 project that, that went to Turin, the Shroud of Turin Research Project. How did you get involved in the Shroud, and how did you end up organizing such, they just say, just this tremendous uh, effort? I'm going to have to blame my mother for that. Uh, I was 13 or 14. She showed me a picture of the Shroud, and it captivated my interest, and it developed. It kind of played well uh... with my uh, scientific uh... inclinations and then education and then uh, professionally working in, as a mm -hmm. scientist and also my uh... my christian side so it kind of played well together with me and uh, it's something that's captivated me for many years now now how what happened in nineteen in the seventies there when to kind of begin the organizing of this scientific effort to investigate the shroud well, in, the, in about 1974 to 76, uh, we were looking at uh, a quality of the shroud image that had uh, possibly a correlation of image intensity with cloth body distance. And I thought that was important mm -hmm. because it would take you out of the realm of this is uh, some kind of a work of art or a painting. So uh, uh, we did some image work, and it, indeed there was such a quality to the image. Then uh, I was in an environment, a scientific environment in New Mexico with a lot of the labs, the mm -hmm. national laboratories that were in the local vicinity, and it was just a matter of time before we started to connect, network with some of these people, and they got interested in the shroud. Pretty soon we had a full-fledged uh, expedition because they felt that this, uh, the properties of the image were sufficient for them to want to get involved, to go out and do some... Uh, serious testing of this to see what what the shrouds all about basically. so they were they were mystified by the image as well and this 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 quality that you're talking about is is is, is what was found on the vp8 image analyzer yes, yes. It's kind of this three-dimensional quality yes, of the yes, shroud yes and um and as i recollect reading i mean it was like you know wait a minute this this there's something weird here and we got to figure out what's uh, what's going on with it yes i was uh down at the uh Sandia National Laboratories. I was at the time was looking for some filters, color filters, to do some color work with the shroud, and I was invited by a gentleman by the name of uh, Bill Mottern, mm -hmm. who had an image processing lab there, and he said, "Let's come on down and we could try a few things." So he had a VP8 image analyzer. We put it under the VP8, and uh, I had previously worked with the idea of. Uh, looking at how the intensity of the shroud varied with uh, cloth body distance. And I, I knew that there was a correlation there, but then suddenly with the VP8, it looked at the entire image just simultaneously and made a three-dimensional relief of the uh, shroud image. That three-dimensional relief looked like a three-dimensional body, mm -hmm. which really confirmed uh, gr very graphically that this correlation worked. And, but, but it did, did more than that. Suddenly there was a, a three-dimensional uh, figure of the man of the shroud right before our eyes, which then really was something that doesn't happen with right. normal photography. Well, that was a strong indication then that, 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 that the shroud had enveloped a real human form. Yes, at that point, uh, without having going to Turin yet, mm -hmm. Uh, I felt that there's no way this could really be a painting or a, or a work of human craftsmanship. Uh, it was more like it was the work of some kind of a, of a process that this image on the cloth. And the question is, what's that process? And so uh, we uh, needed to go and, and get more data that could help us uh, sort of walk our way into uh, some ideas concerning this image. So, so how did you end up in Turin in 1978 then? There were a lot of uh, scientists that wanted to be involved with this because they felt this is something we, we need to look at. We're going to be right back with the Shroud Report in just a minute. Please stay tuned. The Shroud of Turin Education Project offers a live, big screen multimedia presentation for all audiences. For more information on how to sponsor presentation in your area, call 770-716-7114 or email us at shroud2000 at AOL.com. 
Check out our website at www.shroud2000.com. Help bring the mystery and the message of the Shroud to your community soon. So how many scientists ended up over there with you? You know, I've never actually counted the actual official number, but it was about on the order of 30 mm -hmm. uh, scientists All were. And multidisciplinary, various fields. Okay. Various fields. You, you had uh, chemists involved. Uh, and, uh, and, and not all of them convinced that the shot was authentic either. Oh, no, not at all. In fact, there was one from Los Alamos who said that, give me 15 minutes with the shroud, and I'll, I'll shoot this full of holes, and I'm going to show it's going to be a painting. Well, I have a, we have a picture of him looking at the shroud for the first time. He later described uh, what was going on in his mind at that time, and it was, uh, ooh, sure doesn't look like a painting to me. <laughs> <laughs> so he came back scratching his head then yes. saying, uh, I don't know what we have here. Yes. Now, we have a couple slides to look at, and uh, what, are we, um, what are we looking at here? <clears throat> well, this particular one uh, shows part of the team assembled in uh, the Royal Palace, which is right next to where the Shroud was on public exposition. Now, at this time, uh, the Shroud was still being shown in 1978. What's, what's happening here? Well, now, the Shroud has been taken off public exposition, and it uh, was brought to us. The table was then put into a horizontal position, and then we laid the Shroud out on the uh, the table, and now we're starting to uh, smooth out uh, various wrinkles on on the cloth, and uh, to and get it arranged on on the shroud. And, and this slide is actually a picture of the shroud. Yes. Now that's the that's the front image, and then there's a whole other back image that we're not seeing right yes. now. We're only looking at half the shroud, and uh, to the uninitiated, the thing that stands out the most are the two parallel lines, mm -hmm. which are the result of a fire that the shroud suffered in uh, 1532. But of course, you see the image very clearly, but it's sort of in a negative mm -hmm. format. It's a dark image on a white background. Now, what, what were some of the tests that were performed <coughs> in 1978? Because we didn't really know what we're dealing with here, we wanted to design a protocol of studies that would allow us to uh, have sort of a shotgun approach to it, that mm -hmm. we would try different things and hopefully something's going to connect with some meaningful data. We also wanted to have experiments that could kind of uh, not only be interdependent, but could also be independent of each other to be able to confirm conclusions of others. So we, would, we wouldn't base our conclusions just on, on uh, just one particular experiment. Mm -hmm. But the kinds of experiments we had were, uh, first of all, photographic mm -hmm. experiments. We had uh, Vern Miller, uh, of Brooks Institute, mm -hmm. who was the primary scientific photographer. Then we had Barry Schwartz, who was the documenting photographer. Mm -hmm. so, so basically, Barry took documenting photographs of us doing our science, mm -hmm. so, which, which is very important because we need to know uh, how do we do things. But the photographs we took were reflected light photographs, such, such as what we see here. Mm -hmm. uh, we took ultraviolet fluorescence photographs. That is where you take ultraviolet light, shine it on the cloth, then let it glow with its own visible uh, light that you see. It's very much like rock shows. You go into museums and you mm -hmm. have ultraviolet black light, as it's called, and then the rocks glow very, you know, pretty. Mm -hmm. well, same kind of thing here. Uh, this is good because it lets you look at some of the chemistry issues. Mm -hmm. We had uh, transmitted light. Barry uh, actually took that, uh, where we put light through the cloth, and uh, you could see the absorption characteristics. Mm -hmm. That was th those are very useful. Um, Photomicrographs, uh, Vern Miller, uh, Mark Evans took some uh, well, close-up. Photograph it at levels, different levels of magnification. Yes, mm -hmm. to, to be able to look at selected things that you want to look at and then have those for study later. Right, we, right down to the fibrils themselves, right? Yes, mm -hmm. yes. You can actually see individual fibrils mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. that. Uh, then you, uh, we, we took, um, uh, at the very last, well, 10 minutes of the, of the whole examination, I noticed that there were fold marks on the cloth, mm -hmm. and I wanted those documented. So uh, the very last thing that was done was I, said, I asked Vern if he would sort of sidelight the shroud, and we could see these, these very subtle wrinkles and folds by shadow formation, mm -hmm. and he took pictures of those. So those have been very useful for some ideas that we've had. Uh, we did x-ray fluorescence, where we put x-rays onto the cloth that just doesn't harm things. And the image would glow in the uh, cloth with its own char characteristic set of x-rays. There we saw 
that the blood was had iron content, for example, and the iron content was compatible with, with blood. We took x-rays of the shroud. Bill Modern mm -hmm. uh, and the late Ron London took those pictures. Uh, we have a complete x-ray set of the shroud so we can look at uh, how the shroud looked like uh, with x-rays. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this was all, by the way, a, a good technique to use for if this was a painting. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if there was a forgery involved, you could, you could if start to see If there were certain stuff. substances, it would be revealed yeah. under the well, x-ray fluorescence. Over, over, over paintings, uh, the mm -hmm. radiography, yeah. Uh, we had infrared uh, techniques, uh, spectroscopy, Joe Aceta. We had uh, infrared uh, thermography. When you heat the image with, with light, you can actually get an infrared a heat image of, the, mm -hmm. of it. We, mm -hmm. we did those things. Uh, we also uh, did uh, reflectance spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a husband and wife team, Roger and Marty Gilbert, uh, had a spectrometer. We measured the color characteristics of the image uh, and then which we could use for looking at things. But the biggest one mm -hmm. uh, was the tape sample. Oh, that's right. And we put tapes uh, on, the, on the cloth to remove fibrils. I'm not sure we should do that again, but, uh, but that was our sampling technique. Uh, and then this was later analyzed by... Uh, and then you're uh, able to analyze those samples later on after you no longer have access to yes, the shroud uh, itself. Yeah, primarily it was the late uh, uh, Dr. John Heller and then uh, Dr. Ellen Adler uh -huh. were the primaries on that one to do the chemistry. Oh, this is a, it's, a it's, it's an exhaustive amount of research and even though you had seemingly had a shotgun approach you, you, you gathered a, a lot of data there. You know, we're going, to be, we're going to be right back with the Shroud Report in just a minute and, and, and find out uh, a lot more interesting things. Stay tuned. Buy a copy of this episode for $14.95 plus $5 shipping and handling through our website at Shroud2000.com. Books, videos, posters, and other resources are also available, including curriculum guides for school use plus information on how you can sponsor a live multimedia presentation in your area. Check out Shroud2000.com, the official website of the Shroud of Turin Education Project. I'm Russ Brial, and welcome back to the Shroud Report. And our guest today is Dr. John Jackson. And uh, John, you've just explained how you got involved in the Shroud and the, Sh and the Shroud Human Research Project and all the scientists that were involved in it in 1978. And now, as a physicist, your, your particular interests, or you have a lot of interest with this, but, but one of the things that you've certainly focused on is if the Shroud not, is not the work of an artist, then how did this image get there? And from and you've you've really explored a lot of theories from from a physics angle. And I'd and like for maybe you explain some of that to us. Well, once we have the data from the 1978 e examination, it doesn't end there. That just gives us the observations. What we have to now do is to take various hypotheses, different ideas, and then test them against this big, uh, vast array of data that we have. So that's what we've endeavored to do over the years since that. And it really has quite a, been quite a job. But uh, perhaps the best thing to do would be to talk about some of the specific characteristics that I think are crucial in helping us to answer that question of how the image was formed. Okay. Uh, if we go to the slide, All right. Right, which we have here, uh, let's look at the body image. And we see that the body image is sort of a uh, brownish discoloration pattern on the shroud. But we can do better than that. If you look right at the level of the face on either side, you see sort of a flared brown region. Mm -hmm. Those are clearly the result of the 1532 fire. Mm -hmm. Now, the interesting thing is that the body image the color of the body image in both color and character looks identical to those scorch marks in reflected light. Now there's some differences, I don't want to push it too far in ultraviolet fluorescence, but in reflected light they look the same. They don't, the spectral measurements also show that they look the same. Mm -hmm. So that gives you a suddenly an idea that maybe the image of the shroud is not like a uh, uh, say a painting or a pi organic pigment uh, or and so forth, but rather maybe the shroud image is like a uh, modification of the cloth. Something like if you took 
it'd be akin to taking a hot iron, mm -hmm. putting it on cloth. The hot iron doesn't add color to the cloth, but because of the f heat energy, it causes some chemical reactions that c cause it to discolor. And it's, th it's that discoloring reaction that is, is similar mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. I'm not trying to say this was, this was heat, but I'm saying we're trying to draw a, an analogy just looking at that. And, and, the, and the chemistry work has, has actually supported this. It's a dehydration, uh, oxidation, uh, type reaction that has that has done the uh, the color made the coloring changes on the on the shroud. So that that's that's why the image appears is because something caused the, the this this dehydration and oxidation yes. of the cellulose. Yes. Okay. Now there there's more to it than this. If we can go to the next slide, we see the same image basically, but in transmitted light. So we have light passing through the cloth. The mm -hmm. lamps are on the other side of the shroud. Mm -hmm. Well, what do we see? We see the burn marks very clearly. We can see underneath the patches to see the extent of the 1532 fire. We can see the blood stains. We can even see the uneven weaving patterns and the horizontal bands going across the shroud. Mm -hmm. But what we don't see is the body image. Right. But in reflected light, if we can go back to the previous slide, okay. in reflected light, notice that those flared areas that I was talking about are about the same intensity as the front as the facial image on the shroud. Mm -hmm. Now go back to the transmitted light. Okay. You see the you see the flared areas on either side, but the body image is nowhere near the intensity of those. Oh, that's right. This is a very easy way to show that the body image resides only on the surface fibrils of the threads that make up the cloth. It's just like a surface shadow, mm -hmm. if you will, surface shadow of discoloration on the cloth. And it's because the body image is just not dense enough throughout the thickness of the cloth, whereas the fire marks are, is the reason we, we have this effect. Now, I understand that, that, the, that the image only goes to the depth of, of maybe two microfibrils? Yes. Which is... Yes. Which is we that, saw this in, the, uh, in, in, in Turin with our microscope. And a, and a microfibril is like just maybe a fraction of the diameter of a human hair? Yeah, it's uh, it, the, the fibrils are the strands that are woven, are twisted together to make threads, and then the threads are woven together to make the shroud. Right. In. Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that when we talk about this body image, you've got a set of characteristics uh, that we have to explain. Any successful theory of image formation is going to have to explain simultaneously all these different effects. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not going to have time here to enumerate all the the characteristics, but but this is what we have to do. And I spent a lot of my time uh, trying to look at different hypothetical mechanisms, some which I propose, but mo many which others had proposed, to try to test them against all the various uh, things that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, let's not forget the image has this distance quality where you have correlation of image intensity with, uh, with cloth body distance. Uh, and it does it with high resolution, too. So mm -hmm. you, you've really got a lot of competing different characteristics here to come up with an image. I don't think uh, uh, it's, it's definitely not the work of an artist. There are no pigments on this cloth. Uh, it's not a direct contact image. That is where the cloth is over the bo a body shape and only where the cloth touches the body you have image. Mm -hmm. Because you have discoloration where the cloth, cloth contact is extremely doubtful because of the three-dimensional correlation. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, well, then that you could you could then ask, well, could the image pro somehow project to the from the body to the cloth, taking information from the bo of the body structure to put it onto the cloth image? That seems to be what we have. Uh, a possibility is diffusion. This is one of the first theories by Paul Vignon in 1902. Diffusion. Problem with diffusion is it blurs the image, mm -hmm. so okay. it can act over distance, but it'll blur the image. Um, and it goes on. Uh, I have, in my own mind, exhausted all the sort of what you might say are classical, naturalistic type of uh, explanations for the shroud. Uh, I, I know of none of these that can do all these things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And people will come up with ideas, and they'll, they'll look at some structure of the image, and they'll, and they'll key on that, but then they, they don't take into account other they don't the, take the, the total body of, the, of data that we have. Mm -hmm. But if you're willing to venture with me a uh, something that is unorthodox. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one way to explain uh, all the all the characteristics simultaneously 
uh, lack of side images, for example, the high resolution, the 3D, the discoloration ch chemistry, and so forth, is if you were to imagine a body wrapped up in this cloth and something radical happens to it, uh, that this body becomes a volume, if you will, of, of, of light, radiation, of, of, that can, that, and a radiation that can photochemically interact with this cloth and then allow the cloth to settle through this body under its own weight, uh, I think you can explain every characteristic of this image, the, the 3D, the, uh, there's, a, there's a vertical uh, alignment of the body image under a draping cloth, uh, and, and, and so forth, lack of side images, all these things uh, come together with this idea. The problem with the idea, of course, is that it's, it's radical, it's, un it's unorthodox, but to my mind, uh, and I'm certainly willing to, c to consider any other viable ideas, but this idea, in my mind, can explain what we see. So then the idea being that, that the shroud was wrapping a body, mm -hmm. a real three-dimensional human form, mm -hmm. and then something changed in the molecular structure of that body to something, which... Yeah, something, which I don't... I'm not, I'm not in a position to say what I think that is. I, I don't... To, to wit, though, mm -hmm. the cloth descended through the body. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you know, I think probably everyone thinks immediately of Star Trek and beam me up Scotty and the body yeah. kind of dematerializing and, and um, you know, of course, it, it, it's that kind of a theory and we know that people don't vanish like that um, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's an unnatural thing. And it's that kind of thing which, which of course, leads people to, to wonder, you know, geez, I, I wonder if that's what happened to Christ in the tomb. Yes. I mean, yes. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to, if this is the burial cloth of Christ, and this cloth wrapped the body at that time, and you're you, you suddenly are walking yourself into a position where you have a, you're proposing a, a radical event here to put this image on the cloth. Uh, Christians have said for 2,000 years that there's a radical thing that happened in this in this tomb, which yeah. nobody, by the way claim to have ever seen, uh, the logical connection is that this would have to be connected with what Christianity calls the resurrection. We're going to be right back with the Shroud Report in just a minute. Please stay tuned. The Shroud of Turin. In the last 25 years, it has become the most studied artifact in human history. Is it really the cloth that wrapped the crucified body of Jesus? Or simply the work of a clever medieval artist? See for yourself at Shroud.com. I'm Russ Brialt with the Shroud Report. My guest today has been Dr. John Jackson, and again, Thank you so much for joining us. Um, again, your, your work has been pioneer work, um, and you're continuing to be a, a pioneer in, in trying to understand uh, the, the mysteries of the Shroud. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for watching the Shroud Report, and um, we'll see you next time.